The lecture you are about to hear was recorded for sound seminars by Professor Charles Morris of the Department of Philosophy at the University of Chicago. The subject of this sound seminar is Symbols, Values, and Philosophy. Here is Professor Morris. The term philosophy is, in part, a residual category. That is, a verbal basket in which are put those intellectual activities which do not clearly fall in some other verbal basket. Thus, what are today called the natural sciences were once called natural philosophy. And the fact that, that scientists still get a doctor of philosophy degree is a remnant of this historical situation. Even today, there are places where psychology and the social studies are carried on in departments of philosophy though separation is more common than not and is everywhere spreading. And now the scientists are beginning to do active and large-scale work in two more domains which have long been cultivated by philosophers. The study of human values, sometimes called axiology or the theory of value, and the study of sign processes, sometimes called semiotic or the theory of signs. In both of these fields, the scientific frontier has finally been definitely crossed and experimental methods and quantitative techniques are now being employed. Activity in these directions is snowballing, and it's certain that the results will become large and impressive. What bearing does all this have on philosophy? Does it mean that, philosophical, that the philosophical basket is destined to be emptied and that philosophy will then have performed its historic function, exhausting itself in giving rise to the special sciences? Certain it is that the situation is forcing today's philosopher to take stock of himself and his task. Philosophy has become a problem, even to philosophers. To this problem, contemporary philosophers have reacted in different ways. One thought that the time was approaching when no more books in philosophy would be written, but that all books would be written more philosophically. A number of philosophers have seen their task as the study of the language and methods of science. Others have identified philosophy with logic in the strict sense of formal or symbolic logic. Others, in opposition to these concessions to science, have maintained that the activity of philosophy lies in the clarification of the logical uses of words in the everyday language and not in the attainment of a body of knowledge. Still others, unwilling to narrow in any of these ways the province of philosophy, have defended the ancient claim that philosophy has its own methods and its own knowledge, and that these are not replaceable by the methods and knowledge of modern science. Such persons, for the most part, emphasize the history of philosophy, and the least contentious of them confine their philosophical activity to the teaching and interpretation of the philosophical classics. The problem of the nature of philosophy is, of course, too complex to be disposed of in a few words. But none of the positions which have been sketched will, in my opinion, in the long run, prove to be a satisfactory resting place for the philosopher. I will try to give some reasons in support of this opinion by reference to what is happening today in the study of signs and of values. It is my belief that these considerations give support to an alternative conception of philosophy, namely that philosophy is not a part of science in the modern sense of this term, but that nevertheless it may make the method of science its own method. This position, at first sight paradoxical, has been characteristic of the pragmatic movement in philosophy from Charles Peirce through William James and George Mead to John Dewey. Let us turn first to the field of the theory of signs. I will call this study semiotic, from the Greek word for sign, both because this seems to me the best available term and because its use will prevent possible confusion between the pronunciation of signs and science. It is evident that the main contributions to semiotic, or the theory of signs, until recent times have been made by the philosophers. The nature and kinds and limits of meaning were extensively discussed in Aristotle and after him in the Hellenistic period by the Stoics, the Epicureans, and the Skeptics. These discussions were continued in medieval Europe, and the philosophers of the late Middle Ages made important contributions to diverse phases of the subject. Many of these contributions 
being ignored until quite recently. Leibniz connected such studies with the method and symbolism of mathematics, laying the foundations for what in our time is known as symbolic or mathematical logic. In England, the philosophic work of Bacon, Hobbes, Locke, Berkeley, Hume, and Bentham had a strong semiotical orientation, as did the work of the French Enlightenment philosophers such as Diderot and Condillac. In the modern world, influenced by most of these historic currents, Charles Peirce brought semiotic into the very forefront of his thought and developed the philosophy of pragmatism squarely upon the basis of his elaborate system of semiotic. Two points in Peirce's approach are especially relevant for our argument. Peirce had been trained as a scientist, and he wished philosophy to gain the objective and cumulative kind of knowledge that the sciences obtain. So he investigated the kind of symbols the scientists used and came to the conclusion that the meaning of such symbols was not to be found by introspection, but rather in the observations which the scientist expected to make if he performed certain operations, that is, if he acted in such and such a way. Thus, for Peirce, the ultimate meaning or signification of a scientific symbol was felt to lie in a habit which the symbol aroused, in the disposition to behavior which the symbol produced. And since Peirce proposed that philosophy adopt the method of science, it followed as a consequence that the philosopher was to use symbols of the sort that the scientist used. The second relevant point for our argument is that Peirce was led to a conception of the nature of man in which symbols constitute man's very essence. The philosopher Ernst Cassirer, following a different historic route, came later to the same conclusion, <clears throat> proposing a definition of man as the symbolic animal or in Latin, the animal symbolicum. Thus, in the Persian way of thinking, philosophy was to have semiotic, or the theory of signs, as its core, and was to accept scientific method as its method. At the same time, semiotic was conceived in a way that made it open to scientific investigation. And the study of symbolic processes became of central importance since it promised to throw light upon the essential nature of man partly as a result of Peirce, but largely as a result of independent developments in linguistics, logic, and social psychology, scientific work in semiotic has advanced by leaps and bounds until it has become one of the major intellectual preoccupations of our age. It is not possible here to go into details. I have tried to indicate the outlines of the subject in a book called Signs, Language, and Behavior, published in 1946. But important developments have occurred since that time in linguistics, communication theory, psychology, psychiatry, and the social sciences. And they seem to me to give even greater weight to the view that symbols are essential to the formation and to the maintenance of the human personality and human society. Turning next to the field of human values, it is also true, as in the case of the theory of signs, that historically, philosophers have had the most to say on the topic. Discussions of the true, the good, and the beautiful go back to the earliest days of philosophy and have continued ever since. In recent centuries, the biggest split of opinion has been between those who think that human values are not open to scientific inquiry and guidance and those who think that they are. Two lines of thought represented by Kant and his followers on the one hand and by Hume and his followers on the other. The differences center on two questions. One is whether human values can be studied by the scientific methods used in the natural sciences, or whether they, this study requires methods of a different sort. The other is whether human evaluations or appraisals can or cannot progressively become more scientific. Now the issues are again complex and their discussion would require an analysis of the various ways in which the terms value and science are used in the controversy, as well as a semiotical analysis of the nature of evaluations or appraisals in comparison to scientific statements. Such matters are at the forefront of discussion in contemporary thinking about value. But speaking generally, it can be said that the pragmatic tradition, from purse on down,
and especially in C.I. Lewis and John Dewey, has held that judgments of value are not simply irrational and emotive utterances, but have an intellectual or cognitive content that at least to some degree is capable of control by scientific knowledge and scientific method. And Dewey has taken the extreme position that recognized scientific methods can be applied to the study of human values and that human evaluations do not, as judgments, differ in any essential respect from scientific judgments. Since 1945, I have been exploring these problems by a study of the ways to live favored by college students in various Western and Oriental cultures and by a semiotical analysis of judgments in which the term good or the term ought appears. A preliminary report of this work is given in a book, The Open Self, and I hope to publish a more complete and technical account by 1955 under the title Preference and Value. The results of this study seem to me to support the general position of the pragmatist philosophers, though they necessitate, in my opinion, a number of distinctions which Dewey at least did not make. It would not be fair to say that these complex issues have been resolved, but the philosophical development of pragmatism does at least indicate the possibility of a scientific exploration of the domain of human values. Dewey's influence has, in particular, been very great in encouraging this exploration. Work in this field is now being actively carried on by psychologists, sociologists, and anthropologists. Comparisons of culture in these respects, comparison of individuals, attempts to isolate basic variables in the value domain, the development of scaling techniques applicable to values. These are now matters of intensive research by various individuals in many places. But it's now high time to relate these movements towards a, semiotic, a scientific semiotic and a scientific axiology to the question with which we started, namely the nature of philosophy and its relation to science. In particular, what light do these studies throw on the pragmatist's attempt to use scientific method in philosophy and yet not to regard philosophy as reducible to science. First, we may note the bearing these movements have on some of the alternative conceptions of philosophy which we initially sketched. They do not, it seems to me, make impossible any of these positions, but rather to weaken the urgencies which led to their acceptance, or rather to their acceptance as exhausting the task of philosophy. For instance, if semiotic becomes in a genuine sense scientific, it is hardly likely that the analysis of the everyday language will be left to the philosopher as his domain. And if the philosopher of this persuasion says that he is interested in the logical analysis of language, then it can in reply be argued with Peirce and others that logic itself, when carefully elaborated, turns out to be a part of semiotic and so of science. And as for those who equate philosophy with the philosophy of science, they may be expected to grant that if this job is done well, the philosophy of science will turn out to be a part of science, namely the science of science. In none of these ways, no matter how important the results, does philosophy secure for itself a distinctive position or task that will not be absorbed by the advance of science. It is at this point that the rival and traditional conception of philosophy makes its appeal, namely the conception that philosophy has a method of its own and attains a knowledge of its own that is uniquely relevant to the conduct of life. On this conception, philosophy seeks wisdom, and wisdom rests on knowledge that scientific methods cannot, obtain, cannot attain. It seems to me that Peirce, in his paper on the fixation of belief, has shown the untenability of this claim by philosophy to special methods yielding a special kind of knowledge. But it is interesting to note that later pragmatists, while agreeing with Peirce that philosophy is to accept the methods of science, have not followed him in his conclusion that therefore philosophy is without significance for the deeper affairs of life. And I believe that developments in the scientific study of signs and values lend support to their position. 
for the scientific study of signs has showed the importance of signs other than those employed in science itself. Man in his action needs not merely to know the environment in which he must act. He must also favor certain features of his world rather than others if he is to meet his needs. He must act in certain ways rather than others if he is to reach his goals. And he must bring all these phases of his activity together into some kind of integration. Consequently, every aspect of human activity has developed symbols for its own fulfillment. And in this lies the significance of the diversification and proliferation of symbols so characteristic of human culture. The sciences have informed man as to what he could expect. The arts have explored the values of things and how these values could be attained and maintained. The religions and ethical systems have endeavored to provide counsel as to how men should act. And the philosophies have attempted in various ways to give intellectual clarification and systematization of the total range of human activities. It is understandable how those who see philosophy as the handmaiden of total man are not willing to see it become simply the handmaiden of science, for science is by nature only one phase of human activity. Nevertheless, it does not follow, I believe, and none of the major pragmatic philosophers have believed, that this conception of the comprehensive humanistic role of philosophy in human culture requires that philosophy reject the method of science as its method. For although, for although philosophy's task, when conceived as the intellectual orientation of the total man, is more than the task of science, it is in no opposition to science. A responsible philosophy would choose the best method available for performing its task, and it may well be that science is now the best available method. Philosophy can be scientific in method without confusing its task with the task of science or without believing that the performance of its own task puts it beyond the control of scientific methods and knowledge. A philosophy devoid of such confusions would be an exemplification of scientific humanism. We have seen that philosophers, especially the pragmatists, have played a significant role in laying the ground for a scientific study of signs and a scientific study of values, and that these studies are now well underway as part of the growing field of science. But rather than weakening philosophy by being weaned, these dirty infants can be used by philosophy in the better performance of its own task. If signs of various sorts are needed in the various domains of human activity, if human values are capable of scientific study, and if evaluations and appraisals themselves have an intellectual content capable of being controlled by evidence, then philosophy should be able to better perform the task which it has, it has historically fulfilled somewhat blindly, somewhat surreptitiously to be sure, but always to the best of its ability. Philosophy, unlike science, cannot be content simply with the facts. When it is at its full stature, it is also concerned with human values and with ways to realize and maintain human values. Though it must remain intellectual, it must reflect and be concerned with the whole of man. It criticizes and proposes as well as reports. It, in effect, aims to offer a new everyday language, framed in the light of all phases of man's activity and taking account of whatever knowledge man as scientist has gained. The more scientific it does its task, the better. But its task is more comprehensive than that of science. Its task is to give not merely knowledge, but wisdom, to give not merely technique, but direction. Peirce thought that pragmatism would be the dominant philosophy of the 20th century. Technical developments in logic and a multiplicity of detailed analyses of scientific methods and concepts have, for a time, captured the philosophic stage. It was essential that this work be done and essential that it be continued. But there are many indications now that even this technical work has run into problems that can only be met on the level of pragmatic considerations. 
And the situation in world affairs is putting new demands on philosophy to perform again its total task. Peirce, James, Mead, and Dewey are mighty figures in a movement which is aimed to do philosophy in the grand manner, and yet to do it in terms of the methods and the results of modern science and in the service of modern man. The scientific development of the theory of signs and the theory of values prepared by these men in turn adds new resources for the further carrying out of the philosophic enterprise which they launched.